Good morning, everybody. In my capacity as second vice president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, I have the honor to open the sixth hearing. The topic of this hearing is the situation of human rights of, human, of women deprived of the liberty in the context of the pandemic of COVID-19 in the region. Here, we would like to thank you for the presence of the civil society and dozens of organizations that are present here. I would also like to acknowledge the strength of the civil society, the strength of the civil society in this initiative of a regional hearing. I would also like to introduce my colleagues today, the, uh, my dear Commissioner Margaret McCauley, the Rapporteur for uh, Human Rights of Women is here, Commissioner Stuardo Rallon, Rapporteur for People Deprived of Liberty, our dear Commissioner Esmeralda Arrosemena. She uh, we, we also have the acting executive secretary, Maria Claudia Pulido. Welcome, Maria Claudia. Good morning. And Marisol, who is the executive secretary for the system of cases and petition. And so we will start this session. It will, we will grant 30 minutes for the civil society. We have the same amount of time for uh, comments uh, and questions for the Inter-American Commission. And we will close up with the civil society. We also have 30 minutes for that uh, wrapping up. So I would like to welcome the civil society organized here and so, you will have 30 minutes as from now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Commissioners. My name is Felipe Cruz. I represent the justice and the a uh, group of organizations present requested this hearing to express our concern on the women deprived of the liberty and in, during the context of the COVID-19, we expose the problems of the penitentiary system to warrant the human rights in general, and in particular in women, and the challenges that they face in home arrest and when they go out of, the, of jail, and the difficulties that trans women have have during incarceration and we want to propose several recommendations so that they can the states can warranty the rights of women incarcerated women they are in crisis various various year due to the abuse as a criminal policy in the last decades the Carcerary population in the Americas has grown 40% and it increased 60, 57% and the abuse of the, the, the sentences, the lack of health, the lack of access to drinking water, the arbitrarity in different topics have been become uh, over overstanding issues. The pandemic worsened the, the crisis and aggravated the situation of women in prison. This commission expressed their concern over the vulnerability of women in Latin America and they tried to warranty social distancing and uh, to provide hygiene products to warranty adequate medical attention for the, the and the detection for those people incarcerated and the uh, the staff of the prison. Some measures were not taken in time and in some of them they were inadequate for the system. The organizations part of this hearing, we want to remind the states that they should protect women in prison according to the standards of human rights. For instance, rules 
18, 22 and 24 of the Nelson Mandela rules refer to availability of conditions of hygiene, drinking water, uh, food and appropriate health services. And the rule six and 17 of the Bangkok rules talk about the obligation to recognize the particular needs of women in terms of services of health and uh, prevention actions facing contagious uh, diseases. Finally, the good practices and principles that promulgated the commission talks about the importance to, of warranting the enjoyment of the physical, mental and social well-being of the population deprived of liberty. All of that with an approach, with a differentiated approach that can attend to mothers, trans and pregnant women. It seems that the small proportion of women within the population has been an excuse to stop being an answer for their rights. And many of the actions were implemented without the consideration of the particular situation of women, decisions of the government, such as the closure of prisons and the prohibition of visits, made disproportionate impact on the women and they left their network without support. In some countries, they design mechanisms to facilitate the incarceration of people and they excluded women indirectly because certain crimes in which they are mostly involved are not contemplated such as theft and uh, um, drug trafficking. The paralyzation of uh, judicial system also contributed to the delay of um, hearings and the lack to, to release people and other benefits that affected incarcerated women. We also, there, there was also a judicialization of criminal cases such as a consequence to not comply with the quarantine. It was very complex that states take measures based on the evidence in relation to women incarcerated due to the lack of information on the gender category that the systems manage in the region. There is also little information about the advance of the COVID in the, in the penitentiary population. And they uh, there is also overcrowding in the different penitentiary systems. The states in the region did not leverage the challenges of the pandemic so as to humanize the penitentiary systems and to warranty the rights of women. I will give the floor to my colleague Teodora. My name is Teodora, Teodora Gabasquez, coordinator of uh, Free Women of Salvador. And I'm going to talk about the situation of women during the COVID-19 pandemic. The bad conditions the women that deprived from the liberty that are living and such as the overcrowding, the lack of drinking water, healthy food and the uh, failures or the difficulties in the health um, attention, they have, they contribute to an environment so that the uh, COVID-19 can propagate and this represents a great risk for the health integrity and the life of women in prison. The governments made promises to excarcerate women with chronic diseases, pregnant women and elderly people, but this has not been complied in most of the countries. And there is a low percentage of women who have gone out of the prison. The adopted measures by the government to face the overcrowding and prevent the propagation of COVID-19 in the prisons were insufficient and they were were not enough to prevent it and they have created new situations of vulnerability such as the suspension of familiar visits. These have created an impact in the emotional well-being and psychological well-being of women since uh, even though they are in prison they keep on uh, performing the role of uh, taking care and supplier of their families. The states have not adopted measures, emergency measures such as um, free telephone calls or virtual visits to have uh, an approximation to their families. Several countries still do not authorize visits, 
uh, personal and virtual visits and it's difficult to access to telephone calls. It is in most of the cases it was prohibited the development of uh, several activities, academic, sport and recreative and cultural activities. This led women to uh, be isolated within us or isolation. The impacts on them physical and emotional health have not been attended to by the medical uh, staff or by psychology professionals since the uh, health uh, thing, healthcare was suspended and all those appointments, odontology, gynecology and cytology appointments as well. The, uh, the access of food by the companies that have to supply with the food did not comply with the healthy food they have to provide and this also effectively negatively the women of uh, the the health of women another measure was the prohibition of the access to defenders and the delay of the uh, hearings most of the entities of justice were closed for months and they were considered non-essential by many governments and for a year, it cannot be defined the legal situation of detained women without a sentence, and this vulnerates the, uh, the this violates the fundamental rights to defense and access of the justice. In spite of having adopted this measure, the overcrowding and the bad sanitary condition of this information there were massive uh, propagate there was massive propagation of the disease in most of the prisons and the entities in charge of the reclusion centers did not hand out hygiene and protection elements such as uh, sanitizer soap etc to warranty the minimum care and prevention facing covid-19 the statistics spread by the government's own governments deprived of um, liberty who contracted the virus, many cases do not reflect reality. There are several reports on the lack of uh, press, press, uh, on the precise of the figures reported by the entities and the women. Um, some some women who presented symptoms were not attended to and they died because they did not receive proper health care. So we recommend to uh, the governments to take measures so as, as well as several other activities within the uh, facilities implementing biosecurity measures and to be able to warranty a dignified life and to create a criminal policy which is less punitive for women, rethink the drug policy and to look for alternatives to incarceration such as social justice, restoration and other forms different to prison. Good morning, my name is Claudio Cardona and I represent the organization Mujeres Libres. Uh, good morning. By experience and after accompanying several women in prison in Latin America, I would like to start my presentation by saying that when I leave prison, women suffer social, personal, and family problems. These complex situations have become worse because of the pandemic. And while the states have not been able to react to the new problems, or there is a worsening of the problems that already existed, and that has led to more violations of rights, social rejection, together with additional uh, problems. And the work uh, precariousness for women in general do not allow us to access formal jobs in dignified conditions with a fair payment and complying with the working hours legally established. Some women that are finally hired see how the companies and people leverage this situation in order to create work exploitation and environments of risk or violence, especially based on gender. One of the most frequent problems is that we are reported in risk uh, centers and the banks deny the opening of bank accounts. 
and therefore we have no access to credits or other financial services that could contribute to our economic autonomy. For example, to start a business, some women that have been able to find a formal job are dismissed when the company understands the reasons why they, we cannot open a bank account to receive the salary. During the pandemic, the work conditions of women have become worse because informal economic activities, we depend um, mostly on them, were restricted by the isolation and uh, measures dictated by the states. During the pandemic, we see a precarization of the economic sector of the countries, and this has created a delay in the uh, inclusion of women in the labor market, especially uh, the opportunities for, these, for women that have left prison are still fewer women and their families do not have the resources nor the psychological tools to address all the changes in their family and social lives. Many women, when they leave, uh, don't have a house. And even though they are in freedom, they do not have the conditions to live a dignified life. And several of them are exposed uh, to violence because they are women by their family members, their couples or their former couples. It's very difficult uh, in these conditions to have access to a, a house or to rent a house because you need to prove your economic capacity in order to rent a house. In some countries, we uh, women do not have access to the social security or the health system because you need to have a formal job or to have economic resources to pay for health. The lack of opportunities, discrimination, social stigma, determined life projects, the, uh, make reintegration difficult and make women to uh, commit some crimes again in order to survive. In order to conclude, we would like to recommend the commission to include this problem within its agenda, to activate visits to countries, to have a specific spaces to listen to women that have left prison and also to have direct witnesses regarding the vulnerations of rights, live in penitentiary centers and after they leave. We also would like to uh, request the commission to recommend countries to take into consideration the participation of women that have left uh, the prisons in order to include public policies with a gender uh, perspective that guarantee access to rights within prison in the transition and also when we are freed. Good afternoon. Um, dear commissioners, my name is Colette Espinete and I represent the Red Corpora in Libertad. The current uh, pandemic has created several situations of exception. Among them, the need to manage state responses to the emergency within the penitentiary systems, which were already in a situation of crisis even a long time before the pandemic. The urgent need to adopt measures in the current context of the pandemic is especially relevant when it comes to trans women that are deprived of their freedom, who before the pandemic were already in a situation of structural discrimination, which is being already mentioned by the commission in several occasions. It's important to mention that the penitentiary system are based on a genitalist logic and a binary logic of separation. And therefore most women trans or trans women deprived of their freedom have to face uh, imprisonment in uh, male prisons because of the lack of loss to recognize their identity. And if the loss exists, the genitalist perspective still is the one that is dominant. The intersection of factors such as class, race, situation of poverty, the lack of integral uh, health care derived from the identity construction processes and the institutional base, violence based on bias make that trans women are in a situation of more vulnerability in prisons. It's also important to mention that most of the penitentiary systems do not have info official information regarding sexual diversity. And this uh, makes that they cannot take into consideration about the phenomena of prisons. They don't know how the figures regarding the trans population in prisons, and they don't know the real impact of the measures adopted. 
the challenges are bigger for trans women in prisons because of the pandemic, the, with the suspension of the visits and the limitations to the healthcare services, women are in solitary confinement. And sometimes these worsens the art discrimination. In your resolution 120 on um, pandemic and human rights, the commission established that states of the region should provide and apply intersectional perspectives and pay special attention to the needs and the differentiated impact of these measures on the human rights of historically discriminated groups or at a special risk, including trans women. It is necessary that the special measures to face the pandemic of COVID-19 take into consideration a transversal perspective of sexual diversity and gender uh, that follows the inter-American system standards in order to avoid direct or indirect discrimination situations, which would have disproportionate effects on LGBTI persons, especially those persons deprived of their freedom, such as trans women. In addition, in spite of all the calls made by the International Organization of Human Rights regarding the need to uh, reduce the populations of penitentiary centers because of overcrowding, because of a stigma and bias, trans people are not being beneficiaries and are not contemplated within these measures to release people and reduce overcrowding. In this regard, we would like to mention that in spite of the evidence regarding the vulnerability of this group of people in isolation, regarding especially to health in several countries of the regions, several requests uh, for house arrests have been denied and therefore trans women are facing the pandemic in prison. The commission has made a lot of emphasis in that in order to guarantee universal access to vaccinations to all peoples under their jurisdiction without any discrimination and in conditions of equality. However, as human rights defenders, we are concerned that trans women deprived of their freedom are not guaranteed vaccines due to the problem that has been mentioned in spite of the duties of states to ensure that there is no limitations or restrictions that could affect more populations that are in a special situation of vulnerability or that have been historically discriminated. As I said, we need to take into consideration the situation of people that are more vulnerable or have been historically discriminated. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Macarena Fernandez Hoffman. I belong to South Argentina. I would like to present the situation under house arrest in the region and the difficulties that they face. Most of the information is based in empirical research collected by our but the petitionary or petitioner organizations in these hearings, the increase of incarceration of women, um, it also include an increase in house of resident as an alternative to prison overcrowding. However, this increase was not followed by policies that guarantee a dignified policy or the dignified life for detained women in their houses and not for their families either. Even that house arrest is a measure less restricted than prison, there is still a deprivation of liberty. If the conditions for this type of isolation are not guaranteed, the context of lives are very hard because most of, in most of the cases are women that are in charge of minors with monopar monoparental homes and in a situation of poverty. The state does not take into consideration these difficult circumstances when they decide to deprive a woman from their freedom uh, in spite of the family impact that this could have. They do not take into consideration also the necessary material conditions that should be uh, present so that women can sustain or can live in house arrest. Also, we have problems regarding women that are isolated in their houses and that are electronically monitored. So we asked ourselves, is house arrest an effective measure as an alternative to prison? We would like to show you some situations that show the precariousness in which these women live. First, women in house arrest are facing serious difficulties to get a job. 
because they live in a situation of poverty and they are a group very affected by unemployment. And of course, there is a stigma because they are in prison. When they find a job, the judge denies the permit in order to go to work. This failure to have access to a job together with the lack of policies that would accompany the house arrest leave women on a situation of full dependency on their family and their survival is at risk. Without a family or social network that supports them, the situation becomes unsustainable. In second place, punishment goes also to their children because they suffer the isolation together with their mothers. And that situation is not made visible. Small children cannot leave their houses because their only caretaker is their mother who is deprived of, their, of his, her liberty. And usually the older children have to make the uh, shopping and also all the bureaucratic processes and also they have to work. Also, we see some problems for children to go to school because the judicial permits to go to school could be very difficult to get. In spite of that, house arrest for women is better than prison. As many international instruments and national legislation said, however, the application of house arrest is not always possible. Unfortunately, many times, uh, house arrest is rejected because of moral arguments, for example, the dangerousness of the person, discriminate, discriminatory stereotypes like a bad mother, or also sometimes because of the type of sentence or the type of crime. Sometimes there are also material restrictions, such as the lack of a domicile or internet connection or a phone. Sometimes house arrest is granted as a favor or a privilege instead of a right. Unfortunately, we see that there is a trend to use house arrest instead of freedom or instead of less serious forms of punishments. The difficulties that women need to face were worsened by the pandemic. The restriction measures because of the COVID-19 worsened the isolation, the material conditions, and the restrictions to access to goods and services. And this was a situation that women in, the, in prison already suffered in the past. The laws, the judicial agents, and the executive powers are not taking into consideration the situation of poverty and the situation of vulnerability of house arrest women. They don't realize that the confinement also worsens the material problems. That's why we request the commission to recommend the states to implement policies that guarantee a full enjoyment of dignity and the protections of rights for women in house arrest and their children. We also request that the commission pronounces regarding the ways in which house arrest should be implemented in order to guarantee that is not applied instead of less serious alternatives or that is replacing freedom. Now I would like to present the recommendations after, uh, for this hearing. Facing the situation of overcrowding in prisons and the uh, and the increase of the number of women incarcerated in Latin America, the commission must remember that the states and the prison must be an exceptional measure and recommend the incarceration of a significant number of women. As regards the impact of the pandemic in the prison, the commission must use all the tools to remember the states, the need and the urgency to implement recommendations related to persons deprived of their freedom, according to Resolution 1 2020, since the measure has not been complied with, especially the need to reduce the overcrowding in prison through the revision of preventive prison imprisonment and the release of women that have health risk, um, pregnant women, women with children, and uh, elderly women. For those women that are still deprived of freedom, the governments have the obligation to warranty access to health, the availability of tests and the treatment for those who have symptoms. While the pandemic lasts, the states have, have to warranty that the women deprived of freedom maintain access to regular services for mental and physical health, hygiene and sanitation products. The 
uh, contact with their relatives and, and people close to them must be warranted and that is not happening currently. The lack of information over the women uh, in, in prison is still dramatic. We call upon the Commission to recommend the collection and of data which are true and updated and statistics related to the impact of COVID in women deprived from their freedom, taking into account a gender and intersectional perspective. When the visits are react reactivated, the Commission should save the space for in loco visits to women, um, women prisons of the region, including direct testimony of women deprived from their freedom and those who are who are out of freedom due to the high incidence and the mortality of the COVID in prisons is it is urgent for the commission to recommend the inclusion of people deprived from their freedom and the penitentiary staff as prior to prior to priority population in the national plans of vaccination without discrimination by identity or gender expression. Finally, we would like to offer our collaboration to the Commission in the elaboration of the next report on women deprived from their freedom. It is essential the elaboration of such report and to have the participation of women who have uh, come out of prison. The report must show the impact of the imprisonment and it should contemplate an intersectional perspective integrating gender identity, sexual orientation, class, ethnic origin, among others. Thank you very much. In, on behalf of the Commission, we recognize the information and the recommendations presented on this challenging topic for the region, women deprived of freedom in the context of the pandemic, which worsens the context of structural violation of human rights. So now we have 30 minutes for comments or observations or remarks on the of the commission. I have the pleasure to announce that we also have Soledad Garcia Munoz, the Redesca um, reporter. And I will, would like to give the floor to Commissioner Margaret McCauley, who is a reporter for hu Human Rights of Women. Margaret, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Madam President. Um, and good morning, everyone. And um, may I thank civil society for bringing this matter up for our specific attention. Um, before I start and go into it, let me just uh, give, recount a story. When I was in, in, a judge in the court, we had a, 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 a session in Uruguay. And during that session, we had to deal with uh, some cases on prisons in, in certain in Brazil and, and other countries in the region. And um, one of the matters we dealt with was monitoring the directions which the courts had given in relation to certain prisons in Brazil. And um, we were shown videos as to what they had done with implementing things. But even so, it was not satisfactory. I mean, it's historically, known and seems to be accepted as a norm that prisons in the region are, all, are, are bad and there's nothing that can be done. I, I, I think by and large, there has been a, almost a disability in trying to ensure real change in the concept, first of all, of, of sending people to prison in the belief that this is the answer to any wrongdoing or any breach of the state's laws. Now, I've mentioned at that session that I made this announcement and much to the opera of everybody, that I, as a defense lawyer for many, many, many years, 
much longer than most of you have been in this world, that I, had, I disagree completely with um, um, sending people to prison unless they are extremely incorrigible and that we all must think of an alternative means and sending people to prison. We had gone through a short period of rehabilitation uh, practices. Most, lots of countries, at least in the common law system, use rehabilitation and still do. But I, I do not think that we do so sufficiently. And I am appalled at the number, the number of years imposed on people and women to spend in prison. And look at El Salvador and what happens to women who are accused of uh, um, terminating their pregnancies and they are charged with an aggravated homicide and invariably found guilty, whether the evidence is clear or not. I think there is, we have to try to work with the states to remove from the minds of the politicians, the minds of, of citizens themselves, and especially to remove from judges' minds and from their training that they ought to send these people to such terms of imprisonment, which would mean amending state laws. I, 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 the, the, the experience of COVID ought to teach us that it is a very dangerous and destructive act that we, all the states are pursuing in sending people to prison. And then when we're faced with a pandemic as we are, they can't cope. They put the, the endanger, seriously endanger the lives of, of, of the inmates. I, I, I am really concerned that we haven't yet been able to convince the, the region that we need to consider stopping the investment of states in prisons. Because rather what they do is they build bigger and more secure prisons using state resources, which could be used for social, e economic and cultural advancement and development and assistance to women who are, belong to a vulnerable group because most of the women in prison are poor women. And we, they yet, they spend state funds, tax money, revenue we receive for, on behalf of the people of the state on building the most enormous, huge uh, uh, security advanced prisons. So I, I agree with all the sentiments that you have put forward for, 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 for change, because it is impossible that we as the commission and the rapporteurship on women's rights should seem to accept that it is all right for women to be sent to prison. It should be a matter of last resort as most of these women are heads of households. And when they're sent to prison, you fracture their families. And we cannot let this happen. And I thank you for coming to us with this. We, we have to put our heads together and not only say in words what we would like to do, but try to uh, 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 create the means by which we can get through to the states, why changes have to, these changes have to be made and by which means we have to find a device that will be successful. Uh, and, and really these long terms of imprisonment, if they change would also decrease the, the population of, of prisons. Because if you have so many people serving 40, 50 years, 30 years, 
and you keep on adding more to them, they're there they're for too long. And as I say, I really don't believe in prison. Let's think of a, a alternative means to prisons. We must. And in fact, there are some countries where young children and adolescents are put into adult prisons, which is, which is even worse. Young women, young adolescent women. So I know I, I really thank you again for, for bringing this matter before us. Uh, and please forgive me for being and sounding so emotional about the matter. But it is a very serious matter. And COVID has shown us the kind of harm that can happen. And it is not enough to say we're put there, they should be sent to house arrest. Many of them would have a spouse, a partner, who is an aggressive partner. And so you're taking them from a, a dangerous, violent environment in prison and putting them into another dangerous, violent imprisonment. So it's not just a simple matter of house arrest. That does not answer. We have, we have to consider all aspects. If the state sends a woman for house arrest, the state must provide protection for that woman there in her home. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I really do not have any questions. I think all the speakers and members of civil society understand the problem so well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Macaulay. Now we will give the floor to Commissioner Estuardo Rallon, who is the Rapporteur for People Deprived of Liberty and Their Rights. Thank you. Ms. Madam President, I would like to thank uh, our rapporteur, Margaret May Macaulay, and also to our special rapporteur, Maria Soledad. And I would like to thank all the organizations that are present in this hearing. But first of all, I would like to thank all of you for providing us with information about this traumatic topic that is also very complex regarding the situation of people deprived of their liberty, especially women deprived of their liberty. I also would like to say that the commission has been monitoring the situation very closely. And we have included this topic in several documents. For example, the resolution 120 on the pandemic and human rights. There is a paragraph for uh, vulnerable groups of women. And also in the press release of March the 31st of 2020 and of September the 9th, 2020, the commission show its concern regarding the alarming conditions in which um, prison population is. And regarding women deprived of their liberty, we have the press release 7420 of April the 11th, which recommended including a gender perspective and an intersectional approach in all their responses by the state, taking into consideration that women are exposed to high risk situations and also serious vulnerability situations when they are deprived of their liberty. Today, uh, during your intervention, I wrote down, down some data that are very important. One of them is one of the statements, a very strong statement that was made at the very beginning, and I agree with it, that the context of the pandemic has not been leveraged by states to take measures, extraordinary measures that were required for people deprived of their freedom or liberty, especially women. Uh, there is 
little information and there is no priority regarding the access to vaccines and there is no implementation of public policies that help change the system of management of penitentiary system or centers or the public policies related to these systems. The representative from El Salvador also mentioned that unfortunately, justice in some states was not an essential service in many states and it was suspended during the pandemic and that paralyzation of the system of justice also had effects. And we stopped having information about the cases or for example, some um, persons that were requesting some alternative measures or that were requesting uh, release from prison. We also, listen to the perspective of other group of people. For example, those persons that were deprived of their freedom that now are in freedom, but that they suffer from social bias, stigmatization and discrimination, and they are prevented, prevented from having access to a job or to rent a house. There is, therefore, there are several collateral effects that affect the full enjoyment of rights because of discrimi discrimination and social stigmatization. When we analyze any the implementation of a public policy, we need to know all these phenomena that occur as collateral effects in order to be able to address this and in order to stop these consequences. And also the Center for uh, Legal Studies uh, also made a very important observation. They basically said that even house arrest is better than incarceration or preventing imprisonment, house arrest if not is followed by a set of public policies can be a restriction to the full exercise of rights of women because they are deprived of their dignity and they are uh, deprived of their possibility to develop themselves. So I would like to invite organizations instead of asking questions to share with us the information that they have, that you have described in those 30 minutes, because we know that those 30 minutes are only a very short period of time. Maybe they would like to share with the executive secretariat more information. They can send also the information in written. And I also, I wrote down uh, your collaboration efforts to participate in the next report regarding women deprived of their liberty. And we would like to invite organizations to answer the questionnaire that we have for the report on women deprived of their liberty. We published the questionnaire yesterday. It's on the website of the rapporteurship. So we invite all of you to go to our website to answer our questionnaire and to collaborate. Basically, I would like to congratulate all of you for your thorough intervention. And also I would like to say as rapporteur that the commission is committed to assess this complex issue to make it visible and to make proposals in order to change public policies because they re need also, we need also reform of the criminal law in the states in order to address this phenomena without damaging the dignity of people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Estuardo. Now, I would like to give the floor to our rapporteur on the rights of children, Commissioner Esmeralda, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to greet respectfully and in solidarity all the organizations today. I would like to acknowledge 
uh, the organizations that have shared with us uh, very difficult and cruel information. This is information that is very difficult to process. To me, it has a huge impact because it shows us that there is a multiple violation of all rights, especially to women because of the differentiated treatment and also uh, women are affected in spite of their identities. And we see that there is an impact on all rights. And your information has been very comprehensive. Nothing is left outside. When we talk about health, we are talking about physical health, but we are talking also about psychological, mental and social health. I know that the special rapporteur of economic, social, cultural and environmental rights has a focus on the importance of health on the lives of people, especially on women. The situation of girls and adolescents has not been uh, addressed. There could also be in a situation of deprivation of liberty. But they live the same situation, the same experiences. Each of the participants was mentioning the same thing. We have a punitive criminal law that condemns, that says that if there is no imprisonment, there is no response on the side of the state. That is the criminal policy that our countries all have. And I don't think there is no single country within the continent that does not have this reality. There could be some differences or different intensities, let's say, but they all have the same policy and the same reality. And I would like to send this message to all of you because we know that there are a lot of people that are watching this hearing through different uh, media platforms. And I would like to send a message to our countries. This is a call, a voice that we need to raise to say that we reject, that we protest and that we demand so that this problem is addressed immediately because of all the emergencies and the urgency of all the issues that you have presented today. I have a question to all of you. With the information that you have collected, are you evaluating specific barriers? Especially regarding the production of information and the access to information. Are there any documents that gather all this data? Are all these data documented? Are they reliable data? Because the commission has this mechanism of requesting information to states in order to learn about a specific situation, a violation of human rights. So, that collection of information on your side and the production of that information by the state authorities. How do you evaluate that information? How do you evaluate the possibility of having thorough information and reliable information? And regarding the legal decisions that have been made or issued, have you evaluated the main barriers that the justice system has for the enforcement of a restorative criminal law that helps re-socialize people? 
our constitution said that the pensionary system have an objective that is resocialization, reinsertion to a life in freedom with the conditions under guarantees that are necessary. So why the justice system is doing this? What are the challenges or the barriers that the justice system has when enforcing criminal law in this area with this vision of resocialization? And I would like to know if those barriers Led, lead states to use imprisonment as the only answer to the problem. I would like to know what is your opinion in this regard, and I would like to recognize your efforts and acknowledge your commitment and your work. I think that the special rapporteur for women and the rapporteur for persons deprived of their liberty uh, also have a great commitment to demand intersectional responses. We need comprehensive responses in order to address diversity and the different situations and circumstances that different groups of women face as people deprived of their freedom or liberty or during a process of reinsertion into society. And that has to be guaranteed. So I would like to second that commitment. Um, to work together in these proposals to take immediate actions to get immediate answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Esmeralda. Now I would like to give the floor to Soledad Garcia Muñoz. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President and President of this hearing. It's an honor to be here and I would like to greet the here the, the person participant in the hearing and I would like to congratulate you on your endeavors. We are going to lead this work with the whole support of the uh, Redesca Rapporteurship because a few as you said, this topic reflects very well up to which point criminalization and feminal, feminization of poverty that uh, eliminates the life of women, especially with crimes related to drug trafficking or certain crimes that do not take into consideration the trajectory of the victims. My main concern is the access to healthcare, including uh, mental health. We register suicides and self-aggressions of the population, of the women population, deprived of their liberty, and we are concerned, this was said by Commissioner Esmeralda, by the situation of the girls and the daughters and sons of the women deprived from their liberty, those that are with them and those that are outside the prison and are in charge of other, or have to be taken care of by other relatives or have to be taken care by the uh, protection systems of the state. I think that there are really valuable uh, tools so as to make important recommendations for the state, of course, the uh, rules of the United Nations for the treatment of inmates are a very, very important tool for the Commission to guide its work in relation to this uh, topic. And we believe that the uh, that this measure, um, well, as you said, house arrest uh, is not enough because we have to guarantee that all measures can be uh, complied with and the, we find systems, 
sometimes judicial and penitentiary systems that lack a gender perspective and a intersectionality perspective that in relation to women and to the trans population i think that it is important to say this finally i have three specific questions the first one is apart from the trans population whose situation was uh, evidenced by the testimony we have heard, which other intersectionality uh, factors do you observe? Indigenous women, vulnerable women in, in situation of poverty, that which are most of them in our region, as to the resolution 4 slash 2020 on the rights of people with COVID-19, which are the trends that you observe in terms of treatment and the uh, attention and healthcare of women uh, deprived of freedom, and which are the trends that you are observing as to the vaccination because with the commission we are working on a resolution on this topic so it would be very important to have that information thank you very much and i am at the disposal of the reporters that are involved in this uh, in this uh, very important work thank you very much soledad muñoz i would like to to add up and to second the commitment of my colleagues so as to strengthen the struggle for rights and justice of those persons deprived of liberty. I would also like to express my indignation as well. And I share the uh, the proposal to call upon states so that they can carry out changes in a public policy which is a public policy which violates rights violates multiple rights and i would like to stress the call of uh, commissioner esmeralda so it's not only the civil and political politician rights that are uh, being violated, but also the basic like, rights, those of subsistence in the rights to water, the right to food, right to healthcare, basic healthcare. And I think that we have a worsening aspect because all people deprived from their liberty are under the protection of the state. And that is a key aspect. We have, um, the state has the legal duty to warranty basic rights because they are deprived from their liberty, but they, uh, they, but they should not deprive them of their dignity or of their uh, physical health or mental health. And I would like to stress that last year, the commission filed before the courts a request for adv advisory opinion in terms of different approach, which take into consideration the rights of people deprived from their liberty so that the commission can clarify the duties and the legal rights of, of the, the legal duties of the states to take into consideration the intersectionality in terms of people deprived from their liberty because if they are more if there is more vulnerability, the state should have a greater duty to warranty the right to physical, moral, and physical integrity of people under its protection. And I have two questions to make. I was struck by uh, some aspects. I took down notes and what struck me is that today, it increased 9% and there was an increase of women deprived from their liberty in the region of practically 60%, 67, 57%. So I would like to get to know better this reality with two questions. Who are these women? 
I have the answer of me, my country, which is Brazil. Most of them are young women. 62% are Afro-descendant women. So there is structural racism in the region. So who are those women? And apart from that, why? Which are the grounds for that increase of practically 60% while the general population, penitentiary population suffered an increase of 9%. Well, I have several hypotheses. The culture of incarceration, I share the vision of uh, Commissioner Margaret. So we have to revisit, we have to change uh, different benchmarks because there is a culture that fosters the overcrowding in the prisons the uh, and we do not have rehabilitation policies and that is why we have reincidence and the system is fed by this um, this fact of the reincidence on crimes then commissioner Rallon talked about the abuse and the use of preventive imprisonment. We have reports by the region, we have standards, but I would like to hear more on the impact of the drug law. So there is a specific component that I believe that is a factor to understand or to to clarify this increase of virtually 60%. So I would like to understand this reality better. In my capacity of reporter for LGTBI rights, I really learned a lot with this reportership and I really admire LGTB people, especially trans women especially trans women because of their resilience, their resistance, their struggle, their voice. I also learned a lot that the life expectancy of trans women, um, trans people is of uh, 67 year, seven, 57 years in the region. So this is because of the violence, the culture that kills, the culture that harasses, the culture that murders. And here I also wrote down something that I did know, but it is the disproportionate impact that trans women suffer. LGBTI community is not homogeneous. There are lots of indicators and they suffer more brutality and more cruelty in all indicators. And these, the same happens here. So there are attacks, there are offense to basic rights such as visits, health. And I am really worried about the uh, insulation, isolation and as to health, the uh, denial to have treat hormone treated treatments, the recognition of the identity gender rights in the framework of a binary rationale. But taking into account this disproportionate impact that trans women suffer in their life and in their prison, in the prison especially, my question is whether there are good practices developed in the region because as to uh, frameworks, we have certain reports on violence against LGBTI people. Another one that was uh, written in 2019, which I presented, which recognizes the rights of LGBTI people, for instance, in Uruguay, the protection for trans people in Argentina, there was also an important legal framework as to gender identity. So at least there are some clues in the framework, but with the Redesca reporter, we launched a report on trans people and we uh, could 
analyze the level of um, violence on trans people especially trans women and now we are writing the fourth report as to cultural changes i would like to give the floor then to the social the so, civil society so thank you very much and i would like to express my commitment and uh, on behalf of the commission as well we are together thank you Okay, good afternoon now, at least here in Uruguay. There are some things I would like to comment on. I've heard and pay a lot of attention to the intervention of the reporters are several topics that worry us as a civil society. I will start by the last question posed by the vice president rapporteur piovesan i don't know if the if i'm mentioning the the positions right but i if whether there are good practices in the region we incorporate libertad we uh, observe that there are good practices in the region and it's a case of uruguay and I am a representative here and the case of Argentina. Argentina has had cases of alternatives to prison and it has done it with house arrest in the case of trans people. But I would also like to talk to rapporteur Margaret who was posing uh, who was speaking about house arrest and the fact that we have to be careful about house arrest. In the case of trans people, at least what happens in Uruguay, trans people are extremely poor, so they do not have a home so as to do house arrest. So the state should look for alternatives in uh, different houses or in accord or in agreements with the civil society so as to provide them with these alternative places another good practice in uruguay i constantly work with trans people deprived of freedom there are uh, there is a registry of the amount of people deprived from their liberty there is a sector for people deprived from their liberty for people for trans people deprived of the liberties and they have access to food and to labor rights and to education rights and my organization from the civil organization is in contact with the constitutionality and with people deprived trans people deprived of their liberty that is to answer to uh, rapporteur piovesan as to what we would like to underscore together in this hearing is uh, the recommendations in this case we need to analyze and we need to recommend the recommend the states to take into consideration the suggestions of the commission because that sometimes happens the commission calls upon the state, but the states then do not respect the, those suggestions. Then the second one is to work so as to end with the overcrowding of the prisons. That's an emergency. And during these pandemic times, it's even more urgent to warranty the access uh, to health, there should be statistical information as to how many women are deprived of their freedom and there should be a breakdown on to how, uh, as to how many 
trans women are deprived of their liberty in the different different countries which are the conditions in which they are living which are the intersectionalities uh, race um, ethnic situations family situation economic situation to respect the will and this is done in Uruguay. This is a good practice in Uruguay to respect the will of the trans person to which prison they want to go, whether to their uh, gender assigned at birth or their self-perceived gender. And this has to do with respecting the will of trans people. We cannot... Uh, decide because of their uh, gen genitals or because of the the countries where there is no uh, change of identity or names and what the reporter Stuardo was saying to try to seek alternative measures when the trans people go out of prisons because they cannot access a job they are stigmatized they cannot access to housing they cannot access to food so they go back to the prison system and to insist on respecting the different alternatives thank you very much Among the main barriers to the apply resocialization is that there is no difference between the crimes and the different modes of crimes within prisons because of overcrowding there are a lot of women in prison and this uh, leads to having failures in the programs that we have. And also the resocialization programs in prisons are not the adequate in order to uh, live in freedom. We are lear we learn how to cook, how to uh, meet, and there are also gender related activities. But those activities are not useful when we are released by knitting clothes. I cannot uh, feed my children or have a dignified life together with my family. So these resocialization programs are not adequate. And when it comes to indigenous women, Afro women and um, older women, states do not share information regarding these groups of people. There are only very limited statistics. And there are women that are in prison that, that belong to these groups, but they receive the same treatment and the same programs that any other person or inmate. States think that having a differentiated approach or a gender approach is limited to say woman or to give you some hygiene products and that's it. But they do not go beyond that. Women that stay in prison are poor women that have suffered from violence that do not have the economic resources or they do not have the opportunities and they commit a crime as a way to survive. Most of the women in prison are there because of drug related crimes. So those are uh, crimes that do not request incarceration. And women, could have been released or those women could have been taken into consideration uh, to provide incarceration for COVID-19. Those women could have been released during the pandemic, but the states didn't do it. And regarding the vaccination, we are very concerned. Uh, women are in prison are, last only people over 80 years old are being vaccinated they shouldn't be in prison there are only a few persons but they have vaccinated them in some of the countries but 
most women in prison are last in the process of vaccination. I would like to talk about the question regarding the profiles of women that are incarcerated because of drug crimes. Uh, most of the organizations that requested this uh, hearing presented a guide in 2018, and we prepared some recommendations regarding the reform of the criminal law. There is one because we saw a great issue that are uh, for women in prison. And usually, the profile of these women are women that suffer several from several types of violence. They live in environments where they don't have social guarantees, they have no access to public services, and they do not have work guarantees. Most of the women are not part of the system, and that's why they are they become part of the system of drug trafficking. They enter drugs to the prisons or they keep or protect the group of the organized crime in their houses or they keep the drugs but always because they are operators for the drug trafficking industry and they do not make money because of that they just receive a salary that kind of that is a salary they could not obtain through the formal economy and that is how they can guarantee the care activities or functions for taking care of their children. So that's why they do it many times. And together with all these situations, we see that states end up incarcerating them and they submit them to discrimination from the very beginning, from the arrest. They are prosecuted for consenting to commit crimes for drug trafficking. And this makes their imprisonment situation worse. And, and because um, there should be better guarantees for people who do not commit nonviolent crimes. But uh, we believe that incarcerating a woman that sells drugs in a park is not the same as capturing Pablo Escolar. That is what the state thinks. And this is one of the failures that uh, state policies have. I would like to mention another thing. I would like to thank all the commissioners for your receptiveness and for, uh, and also we would like to thank you for your interest in, in what we are presenting. Uh, on behalf of the other organizations, I would like to highlight the importance of the special rapporteurship for an economic, social, cultural rights and the other two rapporteurships help us to uh, call upon states to change their criminal policies and also to improve the situation of centers. States should be remembered of their obligations, but we also need to monitor how they exercise or enforce their policies. And we need also establish standards that states should guarantee. In the area of education, we need to follow up and to monitor states so that they apply the standards that are there and that they comply with those standards and they should respond to the indicators that exist. And I'm talking here about all the system or the penitentiary system and all the areas related to the penitentiary system. And taking into consideration the question regarding information, uh, we monitor the information that is created in the regarding the penitentiary system. As uh, Claudia said, we do not have reliable information regarding women in prison in general terms. 
And we don't have a specific information regarding a specific category. So for example, trans women, we don't know how many mothers are in prison, how many women are in prison with their children. We don't know how many women stop caring for their children because they are in prison. And that information is fundamental in order to promote change in states. And I think that one of the biggest barriers to change the criminal policy in the countries is the lack of statistics regarding the penitentiary or the criminal policies. To conclude, I would like to tell all the commissioners and the rapporteur that through the the secretariat we sent two annexes for this intervention. Uh, we have one about recommendations and the other has to do with the evidence that we have been able to collect over time and uh, through the research of our organizations. That annex will be at your disposal and also at the disposal of the general public. And there we include information regarding the context of women and specific violations of human rights. We collected all the recommendations that have been published by different organizations over the year. And last year, we presented all these recommendations in different documents. We are also trying to promote states to create information regarding the application of vaccines uh, to women deprived of their liberty. And we are also providing some information that we think that would be useful for the commission, for all the work and for their mandate. Thank you very much. I would like to add some other things to what has been said by my colleagues. Regarding information, we don't have information about the impact of COVID-19 on prisons or penitentiary centers, and we don't have gender-based information. And that information would be key in order to be able to monitor, to know the health situation, to demand states to take a specific measures that are effective to prevent the pandemic. For example, we know that there is not enough testing and therefore it's very difficult to know the level of infection. And that would be key and that is urgent. That is a demand that we, is urgent. And regarding the application or the enforcement of the recommendations made by the commission during the pandemic, we also included those recommendations in our presentation we believe that's important that in this specific context, we need to make emphasis on the need uh, to articulate the executive and the judicial power. Why? Judicial powers, as you all know, uh, give punishments that sometimes are huge, taken into consideration they are poverty situation and these punishment and sanctions affect children, their children. And that situation is not made visible. We believe that the commission should make a pronouncement regarding this. And judicial powers do not take this into consideration. And power executive powers do not provide penitentiary policies or criminal policies or has arrest policies that help solve this issue. And with the COVID-19, they have not been able to establish any type of articulation when thinking about specific policies. So I think that we need to promote this. And also to conclude, we think that it's key to continue with this differentiated approach to see how women are being sanctioned. And I think that the work of the rapporteurship of uh, persons deprived of their liberty in the commission is very important for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to know if there are any other interventions by civil society organizations. Thank you. We would like to say that we have the Latin American network of uh, freed women. 
And it's a network that uh, gathers women that were released from prison. And we will are from countries like Chile, Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador, Mexico, El Salvador, Colombia, of course. And we are working together. We are evaluating the conditions of our friends and family members that are in prison. And we are also evaluating the conditions of all those who have been released from prison. We had had two meetings in 2019 and in 20, the one in 2019 was on site in Colombia and last year was virtual. And we are also giving you a document that is a report that we prepare on what that has been happening during the pandemic with imprisoned women women that leave the prisons and um, also includes information about what we discuss in our meetings. I would like to add that our network Corpora en Libertad right now is make, preparing a research on trans women deprived of their liberty in Central America to be specific. And in that regard, we found a lot of resistance by officials, uh, the, uh, there are public officials that are surveilling and monitoring the work of our colleagues there and people are not able to uh, give us on, uh, honest information because they are being watched. We are carrying out this research and we hope that towards the end of the year we are able to publish it, thank you. I would also like to say something as uh, a woman that has been deprived of her liberty and as Claudia was saying, we are um, struggling together with those women that are in prison or those who have been out of uh, released from prison and my organization inaugurated on March 8th on the day of the women days and there was a space in the maximum security space and we could realize the dic discrimination and the lack of um, healthcare for women they are they get only 15 minutes of sunlight during the week and the food they receive is not adequate for their health women that have chronic disease diseases have not been attended to and many of them have died due to the lack of health care and the authorities have overlooked this problem and for them everything is okay they say everything is perfect that they're working properly but if we look at their reality it really is opposing to what they say I would like to ask the civil society whether there are further interventions. Okay, so on behalf of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, once more, I would like to thank you. I would like to acknowledge your work. I would like to express our commitment in the defense of human rights. And we are together in this proceeding so as to change and transform a, politic, a policy of violation of human rights. And I would like to pose three items. The one, the, the first one, it is really important to acquire information, quality information and disaggregated data. So for the commission, it would be very valuable here in the name of the rapporteurship of the LGTBI uh, rapporteurship, but also I'm speaking on behalf of my colleagues, the rest of the rapporteurships, because the report is being, the report on women is being drafted, so it would be very valuable to have all the information gathered here and to try to get even more information because the Commission shares this concern. It needs to have the 
precise and the accurate diagnostic because without it, we cannot demand public policy focused on human rights. The commission also shares the challenge of the implementation of our recommendations. So here I would like to share with all of you that since 2018, we have a, 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 a following unit, following up unit, and we also have the CIMORE, which uh, monitors our recommendations. So I will invite you to check it. And in July, we're going to try to adopt the observatory of impact so as to see how to measure the impact. And we acknowledge the momentum of this mandate. The momentum is provided by the victims and the civil society. Thank you very much for this important and interesting hearing and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for all the information provided. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.